It's a total win. I'm printing at 100 millimeters per second. You're seeing real-time movement there. That's more than twice the speed that I can print uh, on my Ender 3 with zero ghosting. For this 145 millimeter square, I'm getting measurements of plus or minus 0.4 millimeters, which comes out to 0.3%. And all four sides are perfectly straight with no cupping or crowning. So considering that this was printed on a Delta printer, that is a very accurate part. Also, the frame is perfectly square. There's absolutely zero ghosting present. This part also printed at 100 millimeters per second and you see no rippling or ghosting whatsoever. The salmon skinning is ever so faint. If you try really hard you can start to see it but this is about as minimal as salmon skinning artifacts get from any 3D printer. If you saw the updates to the last video I made about this printer you're probably surprised to see it in such fantastic working order. So let's back up and pick up the narrative uh, right where we left off when I was realizing what a steaming hot pile of garbage the stock electronics that come with this printer are. It's a new day. It's another sweater vest, but the same 3D printer. So let's talk about that because where we left off in the last video, this printer was looking Wow, so good. And there's a lot to unpack there because it's not so good. And the reason it's not so good is the electronics. That's it, the frame is great. So first, let me make a comment about comments. So this looked so good in fact, and the price is so low that it was a serious threat to a certain Western 3D printer company. And you guys have to know that this certain Western 3D printer company their entire marketing department is a Russian troll farm. I'm not even exaggerating. So anytime you uh, see comments in any videos or any online posts, you have to know that those are manipulated, fake consensus building, community driven uh, 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 things. There are some people who have fallen for those comments and also leave comments, but the vast majority of them uh, are, are fake. They're just trolls who are trying to, they're shills. They're standing at the back of the audience. I love this company. It's the greatest company ever. Oh, that stupid Delta printer? You shouldn't buy that. This other company makes one that's more reliable. Or <laughs> that's just the way it is. So uh, just be very suspicious whenever you see uh, comments supporting that company. Anyway, yeah, the electronics on this thing suck. They do. They've failed on me. And I don't know if it's the uh, Trinamic stepper motor drivers because they say you know, genuine trinamic on them, but that could be just screen printed in China. China is, of course, not above uh, just knocking off logos. They do it all the time, right? So um, when you can get genuine trinamic stepper motor drivers from reputable Western suppliers for $14 per stick, yet they only cost $6 per stepper stick from China, that's, that's pretty suspicious. How is that same German product going to be half the price coming from China? I think it's probably a clone. And uh, that's not to say that it's certainly the, the, the stepper motor driver that's the problem here. Um, it is a problem where the stepper motor itself is just kind of turning off. One, one of my prints failed, uh, I could move this thing. In the middle of the print, I could move this up and down. And then suddenly it grabbed again and it was working again. So um, I don't know why. I don't know why that would happen. There's um, a very real possibility that it's some other portion of the control board. I had something similar to that happen with the original control board that came on my Tevo Little Monster, which was another pile of garbage that also had garbage stepper motor drivers. And I went to this great pain of, you know, replacing the stepper motor drivers on that board and it didn't fix my problem. So I'm not going to try to diagnose the problem for this printer. The electronics, that's China's job. They're, they're selling us junk. They expect you and me to buy something, have a problem, post about our problem in the online forms. They read the forms, they learn what's wrong with the printer, then they come out with the new version, the pro version, right? That means the one that they fixed all the problem on. So here's the rule. If you see a 3D printer that looks fantastic from me, from anybody else, don't buy it until all of the reviewers are saying, yes, that's a good 3D printer. This is a crowd, a wisdom of the crowd kind of a thing. Um, go on to the forums, you know, the, the Facebook forums and see if people are having good or bad experiences. Uh, you want to get as much, uh, you know, good reviews for the printer before you buy it as you can get. 
Um, and this is the perfect example because it failed for me after six prints. It looked fantastic and then it stopped working. So you can see some of the failed prints there. I'll show them on the screen. And this is one of them uh, here in my hands. And the point of this print was to print to the extents of the bed, to the very edges of the bed. And it's a 150 millimeter print, uh, which is the, the, the largest you know, length that my caliper can measure, which is why I made it that way. But the point of it was to measure the straight edge against the straight sides. And two of these sides are perfectly straight. They're, they're doing quite nicely. And two of the sides are bent. So this side's got a, a bow in it, so it's crowned. And this other one here has a, um, has a, a cupping. So that's cupped and this one's crowned. And you can see there's about a millimeter of, of uh, wiggle there, back and forth. So in 150 millimeters of length, you get about a millimeter of inaccuracy on that straight line. Well, that's just a way to measure. Uh, even curved lines are going to be inaccurate uh, out at the edges of the bed. And that is a problem just of all uh, Delta style printers. It doesn't matter though. For most people, especially beginners, like I was talking about uh, in the last video, uh, so many beginners are just printing sculptural things. You know, some sort of a dragon sculpture with its wings out, or maybe it's a superhero sculpture that they want to paint to put on their mantle, or maybe it's a cosplay elbow piece or something like that. Um, for those types of components, you're never going to notice this small amount of inaccuracy, and you've still got like part cooling and shrinkage to worry about. So uh, it's really not that big of a deal until you start to get into engineered parts, which is when you want a Cartesian style printer. But at any rate, uh, everything I said in the last video doesn't matter because this printer no longer works. It just, I cannot get a successful print out of it now. And so therefore, uh, I have to upgrade those electronics. I'm not going to try to diagnose or flash Marlin or, or I'm not gonna waste any time with these electronics. They're just so suspect. Uh, my time is worth something to me and I, I don't like Marlin. I don't like the convoluted, difficult way to, of, of, of co configuring that firmware or Clipper or you know any other firmware that, that, that requires me to get into the base code. I really like the user interface on Duet control boards. So I've got this $175 Duet 2 Wi-Fi control board ready to install. So what, that's what we're gonna do for the remainder of this video. Let's get to it. Okay, so we're looking at the stock electronics for the last time. I'm gonna pull these out, um, but before I do that, I need to mark all of these um, wires that don't have labels on them already. And then we can see how we can get the duet board to fit inside of this case. I've got this 60 millimeter uh, 12 volt fan here, and it's going to replace the 40 millimeter uh, 24 volt fan that came uh, here stock in the case for, for, uh, for cooling off the electronics. And this 12 volt fan uh, is just gonna be a lot quieter than the 24 volt fan. Um, or it's actually just more about size than about the voltage. I do need to use a step down voltage regulator to get the 24 volts down to 12 volts so I don't burn up the fan here. But yeah, I'm gonna mount this thing right here and that means that I need to peel this sticker off the back here um, and probably drill out some of the perforations so I get more airflow. I don't want any airflow blocked. I want as much cooling to be happening as possible. The, um, the power supply is a fanless power supply, but you know, I never know how smart that is. Um, could be they just used a regular old fanned electronics package and just removed the fan and sold it as a feature. So you never know with China. Uh, so better safe than sorry, I'm gonna add the extra cooling. Now this is a um, junk duet board that I burned up last year, but uh, I use it as a template. And what we're gonna do is use it to fit the, um, the adapters so that I can get the duet board to mount right there in the front meaning that I'll have access to the SD card, the USB um, plug, and the reset button, uh, as well as giving the Wi-Fi antenna sort of an open broadcast, you know, without being blocked by metal. This whole Faraday cage wouldn't do any favors for our Wi-Fi receptivity there. So yeah, that's the plan, and now I just need to make it happen. I started with a CAD drawing of an older duet board uh, drawn by somebody else, but you know, the, uh, the older board it has the same layout pretty much as the new board, so I can just use that for reference. And the next thing I did was draw a sort of rough blocked version of the screen because we're gonna be having the duet board pop out the, uh, the hole where the screen used to go. So I needed to figure out how to mount the duet board itself 
to you know the the geometry that's going to replace the screen and that's what you see me doing here And then I needed to put the fan uh, at the back. And instead of mounting it uh, against the edges of the case like I originally thought, I decided to mount it right up against the uh, the duet board to really get good cooling because the duet board is also pretty close to the power supply. So this will cool both of those uh, you know units off pretty nicely. And here's where I started to change up the uh, the shape of the plug that's going to uh, you know cover the hole where the screen used to go because I don't want a, a big open hole there looking inside. So we're, we're gonna have to come up with something that looks a little better than that. Get the layout just right so everything sits you know in space where it's supposed to sit and figure out how to make it look pretty. And what I ended up doing was, uh, you know, having this mount that pinched the board in between the two halves of the plug that's going to cover the hole. Looks good. All right, well, there are the parts that I was just drawing. They've been printed up and they've been slightly refined. I did a little bit more work off camera, but we're gonna need some uh, bolts. We're gonna need some hardware. And these are all of the screws, or I should say bolts, that came with the, um, with the printer. And we could use these two and these two, but no matter what, we're gonna need some extra bolts. We're gonna need two 15 to 20 millimeter long M3 uh, bolts there. So. Um, I'm opting to not use any of the stock hardware. Uh, I'm going to use slightly longer, uh, shorter screws here. These are eight millimeters long and I've got another set of these 18 millimeter long, uh, screws there. So that's how I'm going to install it together. So let me just snap my fingers and it will be done. All right, let's get this into the case and wire it up. There's this post right here, which was used to install the uh, stock control board and it's in the way. Uh, we don't need it to install the duet board, so we're gonna have to break it off. So let's wire this board up, beginning with the extruder motors. And there's a right way to do this, and there's a dirty, rotten hack that works just fine. So the right way is to use these, uh, the kit that comes with the, uh, with the control board there, and all these plugs plug perfectly into uh, you know, the corresponding plugs on the board. But you see these little metal parts? They all need to be crimped onto the wires. So you have to cut the wires off, strip them, crimp those parts off, and then slide the parts into uh, the plugs here. So it's extremely time consuming, and it also requires that you buy a special tool. Don't buy this one. This is a cheap one with some cast um, you know, jaws that just, they don't have the tolerance there, they don't work. An awesome uh, viewer of mine uh, bought me this pair. This is more expensive and they have wire EDM cut jaws. These are the ones that work. So if you're gonna do this the correct way because you love your printer um, and you already have the plugs, why not just get those, um, get those pliers, get those crimpers, excuse me, and those will work well for you. Now, the dirty rotten hack, pretty easy. You just have to take the, um, the current uh, plug at the end here and use the flush cutter that came in the box with the printer and you just cut off these tangs that hold the uh, that are meant to hold the the clip you know securely into the um, into the original stock control board now once that's cut off uh, you should have the clearance to just kind of plug it in the uh, the, the spacing is the same for the um, for the pins so we're gonna go uh, starting from the back this is Z Y X extruder so extruder X and this is our X motor here so this goes right here done all 
All right, so now that that's done, we need to wire the, um, the end stops into place. And the end stops go here. This is Z, Y, X on the end stops. But um, these plugs, once again, will not work, not only because we have to cut these tangs off, but also because the wires are in the wrong position. So uh, let's cut this off first, and then I'll show you how we change the wires up. I have this tiny little screwdriver here, and you basically just have to push in the tang here on the piece of metal that's inside the plastic, push that in until you can, uh, until it basically wiggles out the, the wire. So it's fiddly, but you can get it done. So once you get the black wire out, that's the middle wire, uh, you just change it so that it goes to the outside. And it doesn't really matter um, that the polarity there. This is just a, we're just completing the loop with the switch. So this is my X, so ZYX, this is gonna go right there. Two more to go. This is the uh, nice crimp job that they did for these little spade connectors for the power. So this is important to get polarity right. Don't wire it in in reverse. You will have a bad time. Okay, I don't know if you guys can see it, but right here on the side of the, uh, of the plug, it says positive V in. So that means that the positive terminal is the one that's closest to the fan. Now the bed wires are similarly crimped, which is awesome, but uh, the positive and negative are reversed. And this really doesn't matter. Uh, once again, we're just completing a circuit, so it doesn't matter if you get the bed sort of wired in backwards, but I just, you know, I'm, I like to do it the way they have it marked, just because I'm particular. I like to try to follow the instructions as best I can. And you know, I've burned up a couple of boards in my time, and it's not fun, especially when they cost $175. So just try to follow the instructions to the best of my ability so that I limit my, uh, you know, chance of, of breaking things. The bed uh, temperature sensor has to go right there. And once again, we just need to clip off the little ears with the flush cutter. Now let's do the, uh, the hot end wires here. So all the stuff that's on the end effector there. Starting with the, uh, let's start with the temperature sensor. Oh, that's the turbo fan. Um, fan, 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 temperature sensor. See, so it says temp on it. So once again, we're just gonna clip off those little ears so that we can uh, plug it into the board here. And then we're gonna use this plug right here. Hopefully you guys can see that. It's the second one from the front of the board here. Now we need to plug in the um, power to the hot end. And this is the only time where I disagree with the way that this comes from the factory because there is no ferrule installed onto the ends of this like we saw for the heated bed and for the power supply. Maybe this will be okay. These are a pretty small connection, but um, in the box from Duet, we happen to have some nice little ferrules that will work uh, lovely. So let's put those on. All right, you see these little white ones? Those are the ones to use and they just slide right down over the wires once the wires are all sort of spun around. There we go. And there we go. Now, there's two ways to crimp this. Well, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's lots of ways to crimp this. One of the ways is to gently use your flush cutter and just, just sort of like go down the line like so. You're not trying to cut all the way through. And in fact, you can uh, vary it. So you can go 90, 90, like so, if you want to. Um, I think it's better just to kind of stay all on the same side. And that, that crimps it quite nicely. But of course, there is a specific tool for this job as well. This fancy Stargate iris looking thing uh, does it all in a single go. Ta-da! Now these are going to plug into the second of the green connectors here. You can see these two green connectors near the front of the board, and the second one back is for extruder zero. So the basically the extra connectors are if you had multiple hot ends, like some sort of a tool changer or something like that. Uh, duet boards are extremely powerful. <laughs> they can do all kinds of fancy stuff. But we're, we're pretty much using it for, well, actually this is a really good use of a duet board. The duet boards for the longest time were the, uh, were, you know, with the RepRot firmware, they were the, the only way to really get good functionality from your, um, from your uh, Delta style printer. Just the other operating systems just had such a hard time with Delta printers, so, yep.
Now we have the bed measuring uh, sensor, that, that clicky switch down there. And this is a powered switch that has three wires. So what we need to do is not only clip those ears off, but we need to switch the wires around. Instead of positive being on the outside here, our three volt positive is on the inside and the ground pin is the pin closest to the, um, the back of the board there, closest to the power input is where the ground pin goes. And once that's done, we're gonna plug it into this spot right here. So we've got the, the end stop switches for X, Y, and Z, and it's the next connector towards the front of the board. Changing up the view so we don't make any mistake with the wiring here. The red wire goes in the middle, the green wire goes toward the back of the board, and the blue wire goes towards the front of the board. So blue, red, green. Now is the hardest part of the whole install, and that is the fans. So the turbo fan, quite straightforward. This is a 24 volt fan for use with our 24 volt power supply. And so nothing too bad here, just the same as we've been doing, and that is switching the pins. The positive pin is the pin closest to the back of the board, closest to the power coming in. And the actual connectors are here. So the first two connectors are always on fans. Those are just gonna be on no matter what. And then the next three connectors are um, pulse with modulated speed controllable fan slots. So we're gonna use all three of those slots um, right now. We don't want any of the fans to just stay on permanently. And this turbo fan, part cooling fan, will plug into the fan zero pulse width modulation controllable fan slot. So from the back of the board, we have two always on uh, fans, they're not controllable, they're just always on. And then the next fan uh, plug over, that's the one that we want. Now, the problem we're gonna have with the next ones is that they are both 12 volt fans. This fan that I've used here, the 60 millimeter fan is uh, 12 volts. You can certainly get a 60 millimeter fan that's 24 volts and then you wouldn't even have to worry about this. You can just plug it right in. Probably the most advisable. However, there really is no silent fan such as this Noctua that runs on 24 volts. So you're gonna have to get, um, you know, for this size of fan, you're gonna have to get a 12 volt fan. So if you're doing this anyway for 12 volts, you can just do it for two fans. It's not that big of a deal. Now, in order to step down uh, 12 volts or 24 volts into 12 volts, what we need is what's called a bucket converter or step down voltage regulator. This is the old style. It's a lot larger, does the job just fine. This is a newer style. And in fact, this specific little unit is kind of hard to find. Um, I'll post a link in the description, but it really is not that important. This little unit is meant to be uh, much more quick to respond to pulse with modulation sim signals. However, the way that I'm gonna show you guys how to wire this, you can even use the old slow versions or, or a smaller board similar to this one that's not set up for pulse with modulation. So um, basically what we're gonna do is use the negative terminal on the two um, fan plugs here. And that's how we're gonna uh, use the, the, get the pulse with modulation, the, the, feed, the speed control is out of the negative terminal. And the positive terminal will wire through this little bit of electronics, which is taking the 24 volts and converting it into 12 volts. Pretty simple. This will require some soldering though. You're gonna have to solder into this board here. So like I said, this is the most difficult part of the build. And I'm just gonna make this happen and we'll talk about it when I'm done. Okay, hopefully you guys can see in this real tiny detail here what's going on. Basically there's a little moment here where I can solder between the two jumpers and tell this board to be putting outputting 12 volts. So that's what I've done. The other way, of course, is to spin this potentiometer here if you wanted something that was, I don't know, 12.5 volts or 13 volts or something like that. Um, and yeah, I've just wired this thing in so that it's getting power and ground from one of the always on fans here at the back of the board. And then the two positive leads that you see coming off of the positive output of my uh, buck converter here are going to the fans, to the 12 volt fans. Now the negative lead, so the black wire from the um, the hot end cooling fan, the, 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 the fan that cools the heat sink there, will go on the second uh, pulse width modulation controllable fan slot, that is fan one in firmware. 
and it's going to go on the pin closest to the front of the board. So that pin is the ground pin. Okay, and then the board uh, power, you know, power supply and board cooling fan uh, will go on the final pulse width modulation controllable fan slot there. And once again, it's a ground pin, so it goes on the pin closest to the front of the board. And then I'm just going to affix this here to the side of my 12 volt fan using some double sided um, foam tape. So I've got that installed. Let's just peel this off. Okay, and then stick that there. That will keep it out of the way so that we know we're not gonna you know, accidentally get some like short circuit happening where one of the leads on that little board are gonna touch the, the main control board, the duet board. So that's it. This is wired up and it should work just fine. Now the last thing to do is to um, clip the wires on the um, hot end, the, the, yeah, the hot end cooling fan, the power sink, or I'm sorry, the heat sink cooling fan and install this Noctua fan down there. So now that the Duet board's installed, we need to tell the world that it's powered by Duet, but that sticker just seems a little bit large and intrusive, so. Dun, dun, dun. Dun 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 dun. The physical portion of the build is complete, so let's connect the printer to my PC uh, with the USB cable. You need to download YAT, which stands for yet another terminal. If you have a different terminal program, you can probably use it, but YAT is just a really lightweight, uh, you know, freeware. Open up YAT, and it's going to automatically ask you if that's the only thing connected. Uh, that, that looks like something you need to terminal into, it's going to automatically open the, uh, the printer. So you can type M115 here in the uh, send text line, enter, and it's going to return to you exactly what the printer is. The next thing we want to do is go M552 space S0, and that's going to turn off the, um, that's going to turn off the Wi-Fi module. Then M 552 space S1, enter, that's gonna turn it on again. And then what we want to do is type in the M587 command. So I will flash that on the screen and you can see I've entered what I've put there on the screen into the text field. Now I'm not gonna show you guys my network SID, SSID or my password here on screen. I made that mistake before. Okay, so I've erased the history so you can't see my password. But uh, basically after you've done that, you should be able to type in M 552 enter and it should return to you an IP address which is very important and also the name of your uh, access point or the name of your Wi-Fi router basically but not showing the password so you want to copy that um, IP address and then you want to put that into your um, web browser any web browser will do even on your phone or on a tablet or something like that um, and press enter and so there we have it. We are now looking at the printer through the Wi-Fi. This is the, uh, the web interface. So we can now close out of YAT. We no longer need uh, the YAT terminal for anything ever again, so long as we are uh, connected to the, uh, to the Wi-Fi. So now I can go put my printer back on the work table and do everything else that I need to do to this printer from across the room. So this interface here is the printer which we just uh, got wired up. And this is the interface for my uh, AnyCubic Castle that I was working on two weeks ago. And you can see this is the updated um, interface. And if you buy a Duet control board today, this is probably what you're gonna see when you receive yours out of the box. But we're gonna update uh, this one here so that it looks, it's got the new interface. And we're also going to uh, use my Castle build as a starting point uh, because it's a very similar printer to the FL Sun Q5. So we're gonna do all that work through the RepRap online configuration tool. It's pretty easy to find this on Google. Normally, you would just start here with this custom configuration because you're not going to find, uh, you know, this printer here on the on the list. So then you just start going through the tabs one by one. You just make sure that every one of these fields has the correct value in it. And sometimes those values are hard to uh, come up with. They're hard to understand if you're a beginner. So it's a lot easier if you start using the configuration tool with an existing configuration file. 
And once you click this radio button here, uh, it's going to ask you for a config.json file, which you can get from me along with the STL files to print up the, uh, the board and fan mounts. Uh, head on over to my Patreon page. I give any and all geometry, uh, anything that you ask for if you're a $5 Patreon supporter. Uh, it's just my reward and thank you uh, to the people who helped me uh, make this channel happen. So anyway, I'm going to use the existing configuration from uh, the AnyCubic Castle because it's a very similar printer. I'm going to go through here on each of these, uh, you know, just double check each of these fields and make sure that I've got it right. And then uh, we'll catch up at that point. All of the fields have been filled in correctly for all of the tabs here across the top. So clicking on the finish tab, the very last tab, and then there's this finish button on the bottom right, generates the firmware. We can click that button right there on the bottom right to download the firmware. But when we want to upload or uh, update the operating system, the firmware as well, the, this is the uh, the configuration. When we when we want to upgrade the actual firmware, like the behind the scenes, the back end stuff, that's RepRap firmware 2.0.5.1 right there at the top. And then the Duet web control will change our web interface. So clicking on each of those, I've downloaded them and now it's time to upload them into my printer. So here we click on upload files and we can see them there in the uh, in the, the download uh, folder on my computer. So let's just click on do a web control open. And it's just that easy. Look at that. It's totally updated. So back to systems. Here is where the button is now upload system files. And we will click on duet combined firmware dot bin and we'll open that. Now that that's done, we will just upload the config dot zip. Two quick notes here. You may find that you need to unzip the uh, files on your PC before uploading them to the printer. I've had it happen where the printer was not able to unzip the files itself. And secondly, you don't have to get the files from the online uh, configuration assistant. Uh, somebody can give you the files and you would upload them in the exact same way. All right, so this board should be completely up and running. Let's give it a test. Five hours later. That took quite a while, but the firmware configuration that I've got going on now should be, well, should do really well. So let's go back here to the uh, to the printer. And the last thing I wanna do is here in the macros folder, let's delete all these macros that came with the, uh, um, with, the, with the board. I don't need those, they're just like for testing. And let's make a new macro. Actually, what I've done is make a macros folder with five individual macros in it. And we'll cover what these do in just a minute. This next step is important, but the good thing is that there are no negative consequences if you forget to do it. You'll just get an error message telling you that the bed probe is uh, already activated. So basically what you need to do is go here into your config.g and at the end of the M558 line, uh, under the Z probe heading, you need to add an I1. This inverts the signal from the switch. And in the online configuration tool, there isn't an option to add that. So you just have to add it by hand. When calibrating your printer, it's important to set the bed temperature to be the same as it will be set when you are printing. So currently the bed is 60 degrees here because that's the temperature I run when printing PLA. So I have the probe attached and it's not really supposed to be attached, but uh, it's okay. Because the next thing we wanna do is um, get the offset of the probe from the nozzle. We need to know what the height difference is between those two. So I've made this series of macros, which you can get to here on the main, what is it, the dashboard screen here on the Duet web control. And I'm going to just start going down through the list of these um, macros that I've made. And you can get these from me when you get the rest of the firmware build. So first one is prepare for measuring. It's going to home it and then drop it down to a height where I can take the, uh, the probe off the end effector. Okay, that's a good height. So we'll take that off, get it out of the way. We're gonna need it here in a minute, so we don't want it like completely gone, just out of the way where it's not gonna interfere with anything. So now that I've got the probe removed, I click probe is removed button, gets me down kind of low. And now this next one is not actually something that you click on. It's just to remind me what to do. It says measure the nozzle height with paper. So here we've got the 
paper that I'm gonna use, and I'm gonna use these Z buttons right here on the bottom. This is again in the, uh, in the main console, um, or sorry, dashboard view, where you can adjust the height of your printer. So just clicking on those. That's good right there. Just a little bit of friction under the paper. It's still easy to slide, so now I'm good. Pull the paper out, go to the next macro. It's gonna lift it up, getting ready, giving me room to get that probe on there. Done, and the final one is probe the bed. All right, time to go back to the computer. Here at the computer, we see the Z height is currently 19.97 millimeters. So we wanna go into our system, config.g, and we wanna scroll down to where we see the uh, Z probe, and it's currently set to Z20. So what did I say, 19.97? Pretty darn close to, to Z20, but that's all we need to do. And then save that, and yes, reset the board. So this might be a little bit over the top and not strictly necessary, but I like to calibrate each of the axes. I find that they vary ever so slightly in the steps per millimeter. And I think the major reason for this is the belt tension. So if the belts are a little bit stretched, then the gap between teeth on the belts uh, is, is wider. So depending on, you know, if you can't match the tension perfectly for all three belts, then each of the X, Y, and Z um, steps per millimeter values will be slightly different. So we're going to measure each one of these individually, starting here with Y. And to do that, we just home all, measure this gap here carefully. You kind of kind of rock it back and forth and slide it, and you get it to where you're getting consistent reading there. And then you zero it out. So we now are at zero. Now we will drop that, uh, the whole thing, Z100, Z negative 100. Okay, now we measure that same gap there. And I'm currently at 99.98. So I'm doing darn good because um, I've already got it set up. But let's just say that that measurement was actually 100.8. So that was the Y axis stepper motor. So we'll just go here to systems, config.g, and here we can see the drives and the steps per millimeter right there is that line, the M92. So the Y axis steps per millimeter currently set to 79.94. Let's set up a little cross multiplication going on here. Like I said, what if it was 100.8 that we had measured and we wanted it to measure 100, right? And that should equal uh, 79.94. So the current steps per millimeter and the current uh, step that we're measuring, the current distance we're measuring. So now we multiply 79.94 times 100 divided by 100.8. That would make the actual steps that we need to have uh, in firmware equal to, uh, what is it, 79. 0 0.30. So we'd simply change that like so, and then we'd save up here in the top right. And we need to do that for all four axes, including the extruder. So what you do is you disconnect the Bowden tube on your extruder, you cut the filament flush with the, uh, with the end of the Bowden tube, and then you extrude 100 millimeters and you measure however much got spit out. And you do that same cross multiplication again to figure out the, the adjusted value there. Now, duet boards have a superpower when it comes to delta style frames. The software can actually compensate for inaccuracies in the frame, which is phenomenal. So in order to run that uh, algorithm, we need to enter in the command G32. After homing, oh, whoops, I forgot to put the sensor on and that's the perfect illustration of what's likely to happen with you guys but thankfully um it reads uh because this is normally uh, this is a normally closed switch it reads the sensor as already being activated so you're not going to get collisions with the bed which is a nice uh thinking by the designer of this printer so let's try that again Okay, so six factors using seven points, deviation before 0.932, and deviation after was much smaller. So that 0.932 
that first number that it gave me is important. And every time you turn the printer off and then turn it on again, uh, you can get a different one of those initial values. Now, if I rinse, lather, and repeat, like if I do this again, I'm going to get a very small uh, deviation, not that 0.932 number again. But that 0.932 number is important because that's in reference to the stock setup in your firmware of a, a key variable for your printer. Let's go to the computer to really dig into this. Here in config.g, we see this m665 command, and that is the setup for all of the major uh, variables that you know dictate the shape of your Delta printer. So this r104.3, um, that's the variable to change, and you basically just have to trial and error it. Uh, change it up, tweak it up and down until you get the lowest possible number when you run an R32 command as soon as you turn your printer on. The subsequent commands uh, are based on the first one. So it has to be, every time you do this, you have to turn the printer on and then off. Change that R value, run the G32, change the value again. And I did it probably 10 times till I got to this number. But you want that to be as low as possible. So just in case you forget to run a G32 when you send a print, you won't get a bed collision or worse, the nozzle grinding across the bed surface and getting all clogged up with, you know, glue stick residue, that kind of a thing. So this is, it's worth doing, it takes a bit of time, but it's definitely worth it. All right, so let's just say that variable is as accurate as you can get it in firmware. What we wanna do is we wanna run that algorithm twice, not necessary, but but you know, maybe a good idea to run it twice. Um, we're probably gonna get a similar, uh, really low uh, error value for this one. Let's see here. So the first one we got was 0.004 or 003. Yeah, we're doing really good. So uh, we're getting almost no uh, error value now. It's actually 0.000. So it's something too small of a decimal point for the error, so it's, it knows where it's at, it's doing quite well. So the frame has been compensated for and the final thing to do is to uh, map the undulations of the bed itself, the, the unflatness of the bed. So G29 is our mesh bed leveling algorithm and we will just send that and it's going to measure all those points. And after we're done with that, we can just pop the, uh, the, the bed probe off and we are ready to print. The final detail, the last thing you need to do to get your printer running absolutely perfectly is to go into config.g and down near the bottom somewhere, you need to add an M579 command. And um, this is the correction factor. It scales the X axis and the Y axis so that they, uh, they will measure exactly what they're supposed to measure when your part is printed. So in order to uh, get these values, you basically just do a print with these both set to one. So, you know, a scale factor of one doesn't change anything. And then you measure your print, that frame that you saw me, you know, measuring there. And um, at whatever it comes out to be, you do the cross multiplication once again, and you get your scaling factors. So these are my scaling factors that you're seeing on the screen. Yours are gonna be entirely different, but that's the last thing to do. So you change that command right there, or you actually have to add that command. And where you add it in your RepRap configuration tool is right here at the finish. You see the custom settings for config.g, you just add it right in there at the end. And that's how it's done. So that is how you make the absolute best uh, Delta 3D printer that you can get for the money in 2020. Let's uh, talk about the final thing that I said that was wrong uh, in the intro. I said that on Delta printers, you can't make engineered parts. And this has kind of been an established truism in the 3D printer community. Tom Sandlotterer recently talked about it in his video where he was talking about the, the speakers uh, that he had to make. And yeah, it's true, a poorly calibrated Delta printer, the closer you get to the edges of the bed, the less accurate it becomes. Uh, straight lines turn into curves. And we saw that with the stock control board, with the stock firmware, the, the sides, one side was cupped and the other side was bowed. So um, yeah, stock, even stock, this board, this printer does not make engineering parts. However, the way that I have this set up now with the Duet board, it absolutely can make engineered parts. And the proof is in the pudding here on my Castle Evolution. That's what I'm calling this printer. Um, you see all the green components on it? I printed every single one of those in uh, PETG and ABS 
on the, uh, the FL Sun here. And this printer now is even more accurate with its prints than the FL Sun. I'm getting uh, a deviation of plus or minus 0 0.15, 0 0.17, excuse me, on that one. Yeah, 0.15 on that one, plus or minus. So phenomenal, just phenomenal accuracy with the engineered parts that I printed using that printer. So duet boards and uh, you know RepRap firmware on the duet boards for the win, absolutely amazing. By the way, tune in to the next video. I'm gonna go over uh, this video or this build. I'm not gonna really kind of go into depth. Not a lot of people buying consoles these days, but it's a really interesting uh, you know, topic and it was a fun project. So that'll be a good video for you guys to watch. Speaking of good videos, go ahead and click here. That is a video that YouTube thinks you're gonna wanna watch. And if you like what I'm doing, go ahead and support me on Patreon. It's a dollar, like you'll never even miss it, but it really helps me out. And if you want any of the files that I've made for this project or any of the other projects, you can have any and all files if you become a $5 Patreon supporter. That's, that's how I share those. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.